everyone. Good morning. Yeah, would you greet the people around you for a while? Just greet them. Good morning. Well, welcome to our 10 a.m. Uh, service, everyone. We're so glad all of you are here. All right. Um, okay, before we, before we get to the Word, before we look into the second installment of our Set Apart series, uh, let me just uh, say a, a few things for a while, and um, uh, I hope, I hope you just, you're, you're fine with us you know, disrupting our liturgy for, for, for a while. Uh, you know, 22 years ago, uh, you know, a couple you know, came to Dumaguete and planted this church. Okay, uh, and we are being joined here today by this couple. You know, Pastor Donnie and uh, Miss Janet are here. And yeah, all right. Uh, Pastor Donnie, Miss Janet, can you please stand for a while? Okay, there they are. Pwede palapakan po natin sila. Uh, Naomi as well is here. All right, I, I, I just want you all to understand that all of us here this, this morning are basically, you know, uh, answers to their prayers, all right? So they toiled here for 12 or uh, 13 years before moving uh, back to Manila. In fact, um, I want to do something for you. I want to call on Pastor Donny. Uh, please join us here for a while. I'd like for, to ask him perhaps to just um, uh, to, uh, to uh, greet uh, all of you or whatever. All right, we just appreciate Pastor Donny for a while. Thank you, Pastor Archie. It's an honor to be here. Uh, it's an honor to serve our spiritual family here. It, this is our favorite place to go to. I, I'm with my daughter, my third uh, child, and with my wife. I guess she went uh, somewhere to get coffee. But it's, uh, it's really an honor to be here. It's, it's great to see old faces as well as plenty of new faces. And uh, uh, we are thrilled to be here to worship with you all. And uh, this church, Pastor Archie and Rian, and our leaders are really an encouragement to us in Cebu. Okay? And uh, thank you. If you happen to be in Cebu, uh, visit us. Okay? We'd love to see you there. God bless you all. all right? so, Pastor Archie, thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I was gonna ask him to uh, preach today, uh, but you know they're they're here for just like two days, so I told them to just you know enjoy the pure Dumaguete air. All right. Um, t- turn your Bibles with me for a while to Genesis chapter three. Uh, this Genesis chapter three. Uh, we're gonna look into nine verses here today. Um, uh, many of you know, or all of you know, that we are on a series called Set Apart. Okay, this series is stemming from our fasting, our, the, the fasting, uh, the prayer, and fa- the five-year uh, prayer and fasting that we did uh, at the start of the month, okay, and we're basically looking to the holiness of God. If you remember, we've, uh, we've covered Psalm 96 last Sunday, and we've looked into that song as a response to the holiness of God, okay? So can I invite all of us to stand on our feet for a while uh, so we show respect and reverence for God's Word? Um, for those of you who are new here, uh, we're reading from the ESV, okay? This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 9. It says here, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So the serpent said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent in rebuttal, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate and she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloth. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the God, of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? 
Let's all pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us together to once again, uh, Lord, gather for corporate worship. Uh, Lord, we thank you because uh, we are being uh, confronted here today by a specific passage uh, that describes what our life was like prior to the works of your redemption in our lives. And Lord, we thank you because um, even as we see uh, how things uh, unfolded, God, uh, Lord, we thank you because at the end of the day, Lord, we look to you as our Lord and Savior. We look to you, our Lord Jesus Christ, as the crusher of the serpent's head. And therefore, we worship you for you are. Bless the preaching of your word. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. You can all be seated now. Um, have you watched the, I, I don't know, this might not be for everyone, but I'm thinking of the most popular one. Okay, but um, have you watched the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings? Anyone? Yeah. All, all right. Okay. At least, okay. I, I thought you guys were watching Shake, Rattle, and, Shake, Rattle, and Roll, so, all right. So, um, the trilogy of the Lord of the Rings, as we understand, okay, is a, I would say, a three-part, uh, not series, but movies, okay, uh, that was shown, I guess, in the early 2000s, right? So, you know what I'm talking about, right? So, um, I, I, as, as, I, as I mentioned the Lord of the Rings, um, what would you feel if I... Let's say you're someone uh, who, who hasn't, you know, uh, who was, was not a fan, okay? You didn't watch any of these movies. And I sat you on the second movie. Who I mean could say is that you'll be having a lot of questions in your mind, right? Uh, because this is a specific film or movies that basically build on each other. Okay, they're not like, they're not like, you know, they're not like some of those movies, like, you know, uh, you know, Born Supremacy, Born Ultimatum, okay, so, uh, who, who, wherein you could watch them independently, because they are, they're, they have, like, different stories, but this one basically, to a certain extent, build on each other. You're not gonna appreciate the fact if I, you know, if I sit you in the second and the third movie without fully appreciating the first one. In fact, you're not gonna appreciate it if I, uh, if I ask you to, to, to watch the first installment of the movie and I bring you in on the 30th minute mark. Are you folks following? The reason why I'm saying this is, um, as we look at this set apart series, um, it is good for us as we look at the holiness, okay, being set apart, it's good for us to start where it all started, right? Um, it's like, um, if you, if I remember when I was a new Christian, uh, the very first book that I have read as a, as a brand new believer uh, many years ago was the book of John. Okay, why? Because I don't know, my disciple told me to read the book of John. All right, so you appreciate, you appreciate, you look at the story of crucifixion, you, you, you appreciate this narrative, and then after the book of John, I went to the book of Acts. All right, only to, only to realize later on that I have, I have, I have a more or bigger appreciation of the gospel accounts when I started understanding the Old Testament. All right. So when I started, when I started, when I started understanding, you know, um, the the you know the the, the storyline of the entire scripture, the story of redemption. You appreciate what's happening in Ezekiel. You appreciate what's happening all the more in the book of John and the book of Luke or Acts or Galatians and stuff like that. So it's good for us to start where it all started, and it starts with the book of Genesis, right? It starts with the book of Genesis. So there's an interesting, there's an interesting sequence that you find there. Okay, you, you folks understand, um, you know, God created everything, ex nihilo, meaning to say he created everything out of nothing, okay? And he basically spoke everything into, into being, all right? And something happened on the sixth day. All right. Um, if you can recall, if you can recall, who was created on the sixth day? Sixth day. Come on, now. yeah. 
Yeah, I, I hear some of you saying something under your breath. Man, man was created on the sixth day. But prior to the creation of man, something else was created before man. On the sixth day, as we understand, the beasts of the field were actually created. All right, so if you look at, if you look at the order, if you look at the sequence, if you look at the sequence, okay, uh, the animals were created first before man was created. All right? So um, it happened in that order. The animals, the beasts specifically, okay, because that's what Genesis chapter 3 is looking into. So the beasts of the field were created first before man was created. But here's what's interesting. Okay, here's what's interesting. Um, when you look at that, okay, when God created man, okay, second to the beast, God looks at man, and man was the one who was created in the image of God. All right? Are you folks following? So, um, the beasts of the field, okay, according to God's word, according to Scripture, look at Genesis, they were not really created in the image of God. Man was created in the image of God. Meaning to say, there was a certain level of status and designation given to man. All right? So there was a certain level of status and designation given to man. And this designation was what? To reflect the what? To reflect the image of God. In fact, God tells, God tells Adam and Eve that they're going to export this out of the garden into the world. All right? I, I, I just want you to understand this. Uh, I just want to establish some of these things early on. All right? So man was, man was the image bearer of God. In fact, that's why it's a lie for the serpent to say that you're going to be like God, Adam and Eve, because they were already like God. Right? They were already like God in that matter. And when God created man, second to the beast, and God gave man the designation of his image bearer, he gave them some task. All right? They were to what? They were to subdue the earth. You folks remember this? They were to subdue the earth, meaning to say, uh, in its, in its uh, more general term, uh, they, were to, they were to toil the land, to cultivate the land, to do farming over the land. But the other aspect there was, they were asked to rule over the beast and the creatures of the world. Are folks following? Okay, man was called to rule over everything. You find all of this in Genesis chapter 1. The very first chapter of your Bible says, you and I are image bearers of God. And our original call was to rule, was to quote-unquote co-rule with God actually. And now this brings us to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, here, here's, how, here's how things started unfolding. So in short, if you want, uh, if you want a short description of what I have just mentioned, Man was set apart, all right? Over all the created order, man was set apart, all right? Then now comes the narrative that we find in Genesis chapter 3. Here's what happens. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, it says here, Now, the serpent, everybody say the serpent. All right, don't look at your seatmate, okay? Just say serpent. Now, the serpent, it says here, was more crafty, than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. Now, when you, I, I want you to just simply open your eyes and just look at those verses. Um, first and foremost, it's quite clear that the serpent was one of the beasts of the field. But look at the word more, all right? Look at the word more. So um, if you look at this in, in, terms, of, in terms of order and, and, and things like that, it tells us, Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 simply tells us that yes, he is one of the beasts of the field, but he is more than the other beasts of the field. More what? It says here, he was more crafty. All right? He was more crafty. Then any of the beasts of the field that the Lord God had made, he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree in the garden? So the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, that the serpent was more crafty. In its original Hebrew, the word crafty is actually the word arum. Right? It's the word arum. Now, um, 
The instances at which the word Arum appears in your Bible, in the Scripture, it appears 11, 12 times. Guess what? This is the only time that the word Arum is used in the negative. So Arum simply means, when you say Arum, uh, okay, the, the serpent, okay, you, you could say uh, the, rest of the, the, uh, the rest of the beast of the field, they're, 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 they're kind of Arum. They're kind of crafty, but this one right here, the serpent right here, he's more crafty than the rest of the beast of the field. So when you say crafty, when you say crafty, it simply means, you know, Arum, rather, when you say Arum, it simply means you're sharp. You're sharp. You could say you're brilliant. You're, you're a quick-thinking creature. All right? So the serpent compared to the rest of uh, the, the beast out there, were, uh, was actually, what, more crafty. The problem here was, okay, like what I said, Arum doesn't necessarily, should not necessarily be taken on the negative always. The thing here was, he used his Arumness for his own advantage at the expense of someone else. Are you folks following? All right. Is that making sense? So he uses arumness, okay, to do something negative. Look at, look at what he says. Look at what he says in verse 5. Here's what he says in verse 5. Um, he says in verse 5, for God knows. All right? right? So he was like telling him, hey, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Where in the world does he get this information? How in the world does he get this information? Now, I'm, I'm not going to camp on this because there, there's something else that we truly need to cover. Um, but scholars would say that, oh, okay, when he starts talking about the knowledge of good and evil, he was telling Eve, he was telling Eve, hey, um, uh, you, could actually, you could actually overstep your boundaries. What he was actually doing was, the serpent could have been an Elohim, and he was offering, he was marketing something to Eve, telling Eve, that you and your husband can actually be an Elohim. That you don't have to depend on the generosity of God. You don't have to depend on the wisdom of God. You yourself can define good and evil for yourself. Let your, let your morality be subject to your own thinking. That's basically what he was enticing Eve with. And here, here, here's what happened. Um, you know, the serpent here represents... Something that's so evil, okay, something that's so evil, something that's so dark, okay, um, he was employing his spiritual power, okay, by enticing Adam and Eve, okay, by enticing Adam and Eve to give up their cooperative rule with God. Remember, image bearer. To co-rule with God, subdue creation, rule over creation. He wanted them to give that, to surrender that. By what? By seizing the opportunity to know good and evil for themselves. That's what basically the serpent was doing. And I want you to understand here, here, here one of the results of that is this. When Adam and Eve succumbed, Okay, when, when, they, when they succumbed to that temptation, all right, when, they, when, when, when Eve started eating of that fruit, when they were lured into this offer of the beast, Genesis chapter 3 becomes an inversion. Everybody say inversion. Genesis chapter 3 becomes an inversion of Genesis chapter 1. In what sense? Because Genesis chapter 1 teaches us that man was to rule over the beast. When he became successful in, temp in tempting Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3 became an inversion in a sense, now the beast starts ruling over man. Now man becomes what? The, the snake, the serpent becomes what? The heir of humankind for that matter. That's when you know, uh, the, the federal headship of, of Adam basically affected every single one of us. At that point, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 3, guess what, friends? We lost our humanity. We lost our humanity. And we became what? We became heirs of the snake. So instead of, uh, I, 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 know, I know 
all of you, I, I know you know all of this, but it's good for us to, re, to be reminded of this thing. So humans are meant to rule over animals. That's what God said. That's, a, that's what God established. That's what He instituted. But sadly here in Genesis chapter 3, men, okay, we became less human and started acting like animals. Okay, let me, let me, let me explain it for a while. Okay, let me explain it for a while. Um, um, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1 tells us about, you know, the, the order of the creation in, in, in the sixth day, on the day, on the sixth day of the creation. The beast was created first, man was created second, but God gave the rulership over to the second, quote-unquote, second-born. And we see this play, say, for instance, in the life of Cain and Abel. You know, Cain was the firstborn, and Abel was the second one, and God favored Abel's offering over Cain's. And what happened was, what happened was, you, you see the progression of this, okay, that's our fall in Genesis chapter 3, but in Genesis chapter 4, we started becoming beastly in our attitude, which resulted in the death of Abel. All right? Um, you see this happening in our, in, our, in our world right now. Um, when, you talk about, when you talk about beastly, um, what is... Um, what are some of the traits of, 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 uh, of animals, for that matter, uh, that humans started adapting, right? So let's say uh, sometimes, you know, animals or bees could be territorial, all right? So, ano po yung mga isang bagay na madalas pag ng mga magpapamilya? Lupa, all right? Minsan, parking sa church, ay! Um, and this is basically what happened to this is basically what happened to Cain and Abel. Okay, we've we've lost our we've lost our humanity. So the question now here is: It's good for us to see how the serpent, okay, uh, in his craftiness, okay, at least for our knowledge, okay, devised all of this. Um, he said he said to the woman, "Did God actually say?" That you shall not eat of any tree in the garden. Listen, I want you to understand this. When, when the serpent asked this question, it wasn't really a yes or no answer. Okay, it wasn't really, or rather, it wasn't really a yes or no question, okay, that Eve and Adam would have answered. Okay, um, it was actually when, 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 when the serpent said, did God actually say? It was like, um, it was actually a sneer or a mockery. It's kind of like this. Um, when I became a Christian, okay, um, you know, I, I, I remember I, I, I had two roommates, and these guys were, you know, these guys were quite, uh, were quite affluent. Okay, the, the, one of them was like, you know, the son of the former associate justice of the Supreme Court. So one time I saw them at the Bolivar, I was bringing my Bible. So, uh, so I met them at the Bolivar, and they saw my Bible, and they were like, and their, their response was something like this. Ooh. They were like reading what's in front of the Bible. It says the Holy Bible. Ooh, the Holy Bible. You know what I'm talking about? So without them, without them, you know, without them saying anything other than that, you know, it, it, it's creating an environment in my mind wherein why in the world are these people, okay, raising their eyebrows over God's word? Ooh, the Holy Bible. In fact, this is what the serpent was trying to do. He wasn't getting into an argument, but he's creating an environment in their mind. An environment of doubt and an environment of mockery. In short, he was getting Adam and Eve to mock and laugh at what God said. All right? And this is, and this is what we see here. He's, he's trying to what smear their thoughts, their thinking, okay, with doubts and mockery. He's getting them to, to, to laugh at God. So when you, talk about, when, you talk about the, when you talk about the fall of men, before the action of picking the fruit and eating of the fruit, the situation there was they were already backslidden in their hearts. All right? 
a lot of times, a lot of times, this is basically what happened to us. We are submerged in an environment of doubt and mockery. And, and then you don't know that at, at, at a certain point in your life, you have just simply start believing God's word. Now, now, now look at this. Um, uh, it says here in verse 3, But God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That's what, that's what Eve said. But, but the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die. So now it's a, it's a full rebuttal and opposite of what Eve okay, was saying as she was quoting, as she was basically quoting God. So from a sneer, it develops into what? An outright lie. All right? It, 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 it develops into an outright lie. Okay? He's, he, starts, uh, he starts casting doubts on what God said to Eve and Eve. Now, to, to, to look into this, um, what, what the serpent was trying to do here is she was like telling Adam and Eve, hey, if you, if you obey God, you will not be happy. In essence, in essence, this is what the serpent was doing. If you obey God, you will not have a fulfilling life. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. When, say, when the serpent comes in, when the serpent comes in, he doesn't deny the existence of God. He doesn't, he doesn't talk to Adam and Eve, and he wasn't, he wasn't there to give them an argument to, to convince them that God doesn't exist. In fact, look at this. He doesn't go there to deny the holiness of God. He doesn't go to Adam and Eve to deny uh, the holiness of God, to deny the will of God, but he goes there to inject in their mind a denial of what? A denial of the goodness of God. A denial of the goodness of God. The serpent wanted Adam and Eve to question God's intention and God's goodness over their life. And it's a subtle, it's a subtle way of doing this. In a, in a sense, you know, the serpent was like telling, you cannot trust God because his intentions for you are not the best for you. And as I, as I was looking at this, and I realized, wait, um, okay, to a certain extent, even for us Christians, this happened to us. When you start, all right, and I will assume I will assume that all of us have experienced this at one point in our life, all right? When you start doubting God's goodness over your life, for us here this morning, I realize that we do either of these two things. When we sin, okay? When you start, uh, when you start disbelieving, when you start doubting God's goodness over your life, we do either of these two things. First, we either skim or we settle. All right? We either skim or we settle. Okay, let me, let me bring this down to, to our own personal experiences. Yesterday, um, we had the privilege of witnessing, okay, uh, the wedding of Don, okay, and Rai. Okay, and, you know, I, I remember, you know, um, I, I, I want to I look into that because, you know, Dawn used to be one of our students here. Right? She used to be one of our students here, eventually became a lawyer, and yesterday it was a joy to officiate her wedding. All right? I mean, you, I mean, you, know, you know Dawn, all right? Many of you, right? So now, here's the thing. Um, that's, that's one example. So a lot of times, okay, a lot of times, when someone gets married, right? When someone gets married, when someone gets to hold their newborn. When someone gets to have uh, a vacation. When someone gets to drive a brand new car. When someone, you know, uh, gets into a relationship, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. When someone gets to buy their dream house. Here's what's happening in our minds sometimes. All right? I'm, not saying, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes, all right? When, some, when you look at the photos of Dawn and stuff like that, 
what's running in our mind is that sometimes we are actually happy for the person, but we're not truly happy for ourselves. Are folks with me? You guys experience that? Some of you are lying. We're happy for the person, but we're not truly happy for ourselves. Why? Here's, what ha- what, here's, what's, here's what's crossing our mind. You say, huh, under normal circumstances, that will not happen to me. Under normal circumstances, uh, that will not happen to me. She will never like me. She will never, she will never look at me. He will never notice me. I will never have that job. I will never get promoted. Under normal circumstances, that will not happen to me. And the sad thing there is that if you look at that, you go back to what I just said a while ago. Now you're submerged in an environment of doubt and sometimes smackery. And what happens is you skim. You skim or you settle. We skim in a sense, what do we do? We, we use our own arumness to get what we want. I want you all to understand, that's not trusting God. When you start doubting God's goodness over your life, you stop trusting God over your life. So you use your arumness. That's, I want you to understand this. That's so serpentine. You use your arumness, your own craftiness to, to, to get your way in order to get something. I want him to notice me. So let's, 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 put a, let's put a little cleavage on this. Oh, let's, let's, here's what we can do. Here's what we can do. Let's, Let's try to undervalue the the amount of the property so that we don't have to pay this much, that much. Why? Because you've already placed yourself in a position where you think God is not good over your life. And it can cause these things to be experienced by you. And sometimes, if we don't skim, if we don't skim, we settle. We settle in a sense that we have already refused to believe what God's best is for us. You're like, ah, it's okay. I'm, con- I, I, I'm, I'm already contented. Sometimes it's not contentment, it's resignation. You've stopped believing that the God of the universe can bring about these things over your life. So we scheme and we settle when we start doubting God's goodness and God's intention over our lives. And this is what the serpent did with Adam and Eve. And guess what, friends? This is the same thing that the serpent is doing to every single one of us, especially Filipinos. You know why? You know why I say especially Filipinos? Because I realize there is no group of people out there who's so smothered with online stuff than Filipinos. So the problem here is, the problem here is we we see this person having that, we see this person doing that, and you feel like it's causing anxiety in your lives. And we start believing the lies of the devil. So what do we do? We skim or we settle more than trusting God and God's goodness of our life. Look at verse 6. When the woman saw. So now, I want you to understand verse 6. Verse 6 pa lang po. Actually, verse 6 pa lang. Baksli din na yung heart niya. All right? 
starts reasoning with God's word. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, here's what happened. Da -da -da -da. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Now, this is not an argument for couples here to say whose fault it is. But if you look at this, uh, you know, um, you know uh, my, my folks are here, my parents are here, and it's like all day, every day, they're watching either America's Got Talent or 48 Hours. You know, like, you know, murder stories. It's like, are, are you gonna murder each other or what? <laughs> and when I, when I sat with them and, and when they were, were watching these, uh, you know, documentaries about murders and stuff, like, whoa. You know, uh, it's like, you, you can think of you can think of the worst thing that a man can do, and it's actually on those films. Now, let's look at what they did. Let's look at what they did. Um, what was their great sin? <laughs> what was their great sin? What was this horrible action that they did? If you look at, if you look at verse 6, what was the horrible action? What, 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 what ruined human race? What ruined human race? It's crazy. I mean, if you look at this, uh, when you say, when you steal from someone, you can say, hey, grab it, that's so bad. That's so evil. When you gossip against someone, you can say, hey, that's so evil. What they did was they ate the fruit. They ate, they ate the fruit. The fruit that God prohibited them from eating. I mean, just, just think about this for a while. I mean, all of this mess, all of this mess, friends, all of this mess over a fruit. All of this mess over a fruit. Let's try to, let's, let's try to look into the, this, this, the, the narrative and the scenario here. What if, what if God could have just explained it? What did God say? Hey, Adam and Eve, guess what? This is paradise. Look around you, it's paradise. It's paradise right here. You can eat anything that you want, Adam and Eve. This is like, this is like buffet for you. But don't eat of that tree, of the fruit of that tree right there. Don't, don't even touch the tree. Is that what God said? That's what He said, isn't it? But don't you think it would have been easier for God said, Hey, this is paradise. You can eat anything except for the tree right there. Don't you even go near that. Don't you even touch that. Because if you touch and eat of that fruit, you will die. You will cause such a big mess. You will have, uh, you will get into like an internal condemnation and all of these things. You know, he will start, you know, God could have explained all of these things to Adam and Eve. If you eat of the fruit, this is what's going to happen. Number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, number six. So what will Adam and Eve do? They will like say, okay, we're not going to eat of that. You know why? Because it's not worth it. It's not worth it. If God explained it that way, and they have refused to eat of that fruit, they would have said, hey, I'm not, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna eat of that fruit because it's not worth it. What ha what's, what's happening here? If God explained that, then their obedience is based only on a cost-benefit analysis. They're like, okay, since you've explained it, we're not gonna eat of that fruit because it will harm us. Us. So what is in line is still their self-interest. What is their sin is still their self-interest. So God simply says, do not eat of that fruit. Why? Because I said so. Because I said so. And a lot of you need, a lot of you here this morning, you, you, you folks need to hear that. I mean, there's so many reasoning in our minds as to why I need to surrender this, I need to give this up. And a lot of times, you, you think about the cost-benefit analysis. Ah, because I need to take care of my reputation, because people in church are watching me, because people, because my disciple will talk to me. At the end of the day, you obey because God is God. Because God is holy. Do you folks realize that God, He doesn't have to explain anything to us. 
So their obedience, supposedly, you know, they were given a chance. God did not explain it to give them a chance to fully obey Him because He was God. So in essence, God was like, hey, your life is a gift. Adam, you, you, you know, your name is from Adama. You're from the ground. I gifted you with the breath of life. Your existence is a gift. I am God, you are not. They were given the opportunity to actually, to actually obey. I'm, I'm thinking about this, and sometimes, um, you know, sometimes there are so many rules, quote unquote rules. And one of the things I can I, I keep hearing from people is, hey, uh, uh, the church can be the church is legalistic. The church tends to be legalistic and stuff like that. Well, of course we don't want the church to be legalistic. But sometimes, you know, um, there are when you look into God's word, you're asked you're asked to stop lying, don't lie, don't cheat, don't have an affair, don't have an extramarital relationship, don't have an extramarital you know, sex, don't, don't fornicate on all of this. A lot of times, what's important for us is not just to look at the rules, not just to look at the law, but, but to look through the rules. To, to, to look through it. That we obey God, not because of our own cost-benefit analysis, but we obey Him because He is God, amen. I mean, think about anxiety. Okay, I wanna, I wanna see your show of hands. Okay, I wanna see your show of hands. Who I mean, you, you get, you get anxious sometimes. A lot of us, we get anxious a lot of times. I get anxious a lot of times, and I realize, you know, being anxious is a natural human response. Staying anxious is a sin. We get anxious when things don't go our way. We get anxious when uh, we get anxious when uh, the the mugs, the plates, the table isn't arranged a certain way. We get we get anxious. The wives we get anxious when when the husband comes home because you're thinking about hey uh, where is he going to hurl the, the the dirty clothes and stuff like that. Why is that so? We get anxious because we want to be in control. We want our life to get into a certain trajectory and refuse to open up our lives to how God wants your life to be orchestrated and how your life should be unfolded according to His will. And at the end of the day, it's what? It's a refusal still to trust God. You're like telling God, Lord, uh, I can't trust you. That's why I'm going to do this my way. I'm going to do it myself. And like what I said, we end up what? We end up scheming and we end up settling. Either of these two things. Let me tell you a story of a guy by the name of William Borden. You know, William Borden say, was, sorry, was a uh, Chicago native. Uh, he was coming from an affluent family, okay, an influential family. They were so wealthy. He attended Yale University. And at one point in his life, okay, when he was a student, he decided to, you know, when he was a student, he decided that he's going to become a cross-cultural missionary to the nation of Mongolia and, north, and, and everything north of China. So he, he fully embraced that. So when he graduated of all schools, when he graduated from Yale, here's what he did. He told his family about his plans and every single one of them were disappointed with him. Make the matter worse, okay, he gave away all of his inheritance. He gave away all of his inheritance, like millions of dollars. He gave it away 
to what? To to uh to institutions that uh, that mobilize world missions. And he went uh, he went to the Middle East first to what? To learn Arabic. I mean, that's his first stop to minister there. And then his dream was to go to Mongolia. So he learned Arabic. And the problem was, when he was there, just, I don't know, maybe a year in, a year in, he got sick. Start, his health started failing. And the man died. The man died. And they saw a letter on his deathbed in his, in his diary. And here's what it says. He says, he had three, he had this phrase, he wrote it there when he was dying, all right? When he was dying. Here's what he says. He says, no reserve, no retreats, no regrets. He says, no reserve, no retreat, no regrets. A man submitted himself fully to the will of God. And then here he was, he was dying. You know, he could have said, Lord, what is happening? He could have, he could have written in his diary, Lord, what is happening? I have obeyed you. I have, I have committed myself to you. Lord, I have given my wealth away. I want to serve you, Lord, for the rest of my life. And this is what's happening to me. But instead he says, no regrets, no, reserve, no reserves. He says, no retreat. Why? Because this man didn't obey God for his legacy. This man didn't obey God for the results. This man didn't obey God for the reputation. This man didn't obey God to compete with the great cross-cultural missionaries out there. No, he obeyed God because God is God. He obeyed the Lord because God is God. At the end of the day, if you try to reflect on the mundane, you know, the, the, you think about your, your big tickets, your big, your, your big ticket obedience and your small obedience. Who is that for? Who is that for? What is that for? Is that for your own self? Or you're simply obeying God because God is God. And I hope we get to like reflect on this. Um, because apart from God's lordship over our lives, I don't know. Like what I said, um, like what I said last week. If I come, at the, uh, if, I, if I arrive at your doorstep, if I knock at your door, at your gate, your doorstep, and you open the door, and I tell you, hey, I'm Archie Lim. Can you let me in? You don't, you, you don't go tell me, okay, all right, we have, some, we have some food here. We have some juice here. We have some crackers here. Okay, Archie, you can come in. Lim, you stay behind. Does it make sense? Ah, uh, no, no, no. I'm Archie Lim. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Archie, you can come in. Lim, you stay at the door. You can't. Because that's who I am. In the same way, friends, you cannot embrace Jesus just for His love. You cannot just embrace Jesus for His mercy. You cannot just embrace Jesus for His grace. But you need to embrace the entirety of who He is. You need to embrace His holiness. You need to embrace the fact that He's Lord over your life. And not just pick the certain details that we want, and that we want for ourselves. And I, don't, I, I fully understand this. I fully know this. As I'm, as, I'm, as I'm talking right now, I know for a fact, I know for a fact that the Holy Spirit is pointing some things in your life and telling you, hey, this one, this area. This, this, this specific area. This specific area, Archie. Archie, this one. You need to surrender this and trust me. And trust me. 
Can we be reminded of this, all of us in this room? Can we be reminded of this? God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. God's will is good, pleasing, and perfect. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden at the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Where are you? When we, be, when we become schemers and settlers, we become hiders. We start hiding. We start hiding. First, you hide from yourself. You hide from yourself. What does it mean? You don't want to... You hide from yourself. You, we don't want to confront our own sinfulness. You hide from the fact that you don't wanna you don't wanna make a, a a personal assessment of yourself. All of you were married here, all of you all of you couples, or you are in a relationship. Remember remember the times when you have when you have arguments against each other? What what comes into your mind? It's his fault. It's his fault. He's the one who's got who needs to say sorry. It's her fault. She needs to learn how to say sorry. When we start hiding from ourselves, we don't make a personal assessment of our own life. We hide from ourselves. Then what happens next? We hide from other people. We hide from other people. By what? By being dishonest. By lying. We start, we start being dishonest. We start you know, crafting lies about certain things. And lastly, as you understand, we hide from the presence of God. You know, it's crazy. When we sin against God, we stay away from the church. And that's not a good thing to do. All the more that we have to be with God's people. But when we sin, we hide from God because in the presence of God, we see what we don't want to see. Because in the presence of God, everything is laid bare. Every details, detail of our life is seen. What do we understand from verses 8 to 9? I'm, I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. How many minutes do I have? <laughs> Sabi ko, how many minutes do I have? Sabi niya. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> Sumo, so I surrender. <laughs> We become hiders. When we scheme, we settle, we become hiders. Here's one truth that I want you to understand and fully embrace this. Yes, it's true. We become hiders. But God always remains to be a seeker. You see it here. It's our nature to hide. I want you to understand that. Tell your seatmate for It's your nature to hide. Right? Do we agree with that? Are we all agreeing with that? It's our nature to hide. All right. If that's a tr- if that, if that's a truth, here's what I want you to understand: it's God's nature to seek. God's nature to seek. When you've fully given up on your faith, I want you to understand this: at certain point in your life, you will find it the fact that the Lord is seeking you. That the Lord reminds you of the joy of your salvation. That the Lord reminds you it's not worth it. It's not worth, you know, squandering that which the Lord has endowed upon your life. The Lord remains to be a seeker. He engages with us. He engages in love. Notice when he, when he was walking in the cool of the day, he simply asked, Where are you? It's not like our moms. <laughs> Hi! <laughs> and 
as if God doesn't know where they are. God fully understands. God fully knows where they were. He simply, he was simply asking that question to engage them in love. In love to engage with them. To draw out something. Perhaps to draw out repentance. In love, God engages. In love, He wants us to He wants us to engage with Him in a conversation. And here's how it ends. Here's how it ends. If God is a seeker, the ultimate expression of God seeking you and me is when Jesus died on the cross. I share this, I share this with uh, the staff last Sunday, uh, last Tuesday. Paul said, do not be anxious about anything. Right? But in prayer and petition, present your request in thanksgiving before God. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Listen, if you have your disciple, you have someone in church tell you, ah, uh, and, and this, is, this is how crazy your situation is right now, an attorney, attorney comes to you and tells you, oh, bro, do not be anxious. Parang, huh? Are you so detached with the reality? Do not be anxious. Ikaw kaya mag, ikaw kaya mag-answer ng med school exams ko. Ikaw kaya mawala ng pera. Do not be anxious. Here's what, here's what many of you do not realize. Before the words, do not be anxious, There are four words there. And here's what it says. The Lord is near. We, a lot of times we skip that and go straight to do not be anxious about anything. But it says there, the premise of that is do not be anxious because the Lord is near. If you fully embrace and understand the nearness of God, His presence is like going to be a bomb that will calm your soul. His nearness, His incarnation is an exclamation point. His crucifixion, His resurrection yells at all of us to tell us that God from the very beginning has always been a seeker. He has always sought us out. Isn't it interesting? On a good day, on a bright sunny day, Adam and Eve disobeyed God over this tree. On a gloomy day, on the, on, the, on, on the Garden of Gethsemane, on the same garden, Garden of Eden, Garden of Gethsemane, on a gloomy day, Jesus obeyed God about the tree, which is the cross. In the Garden of Eden, God was like, God was like telling, an, God was like telling an Eve, uh, if you obey, okay, if you, if you obey, you will leave. Adam and Eve, if you obey, you will live. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the other garden, God was like telling Jesus, if you obey, you will be crushed. And he obeyed, and he was crushed. Guess what, friends? For our sake. That's why Genesis chapter 3, 15, 16 tells us that one will come, that the Son of Man will crush the head of the serpent and will restore to us that which was taken away from us. It is because of what? The work of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has, always, God has always been a seeker. And I want you all to understand this. Today, tomorrow, the next coming days, there will be serpentine lies that's going to be hurled against you. You'll be submerged in an environment of doubt, submerged in an environment of mockery. But I hope and pray that every single one of us here will stick it with God's sword and will obey Jesus Christ, will obey God because He is God. That we will never doubt His goodness ever again. Lord, we thank You for today. We thank You, Lord, for Your grace in our lives. Lord, we thank You because we understand, Lord, that Your intentions for us are and have always been good. Many of us here, Lord, are in a situation where sometimes we don't understand what's happening. Things do not add up. And as a result, even as Christians, 
we end up becoming schemers and settlers. We scheme our way towards something. We settle in where we are because we have already refused to believe that you're good. But Lord, by your grace, teach us to trust you once again. Teach us, Lord, to learn to trust you. It might be a difficult and painful journey, but Lord, make us understand that nothing is more fulfilling in this lifetime than to obey your very word. And Lord, I also pray for many of us here today who are in a difficult situation right now. And some of us, Lord, are thinking about scheming or settling. God, I pray that we will all learn to believe your goodness once again and trust that the God that we serve is a good God. Lord, you are a good Father to us. So Lord, today, we bless you, Father God. Lord Jesus Christ, we praise your name. Holy Spirit, we bless you. Thank you for, for appropriating this gospel truth in our lives. Triune God, we worship you and glorify you. We thank you for who you are. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we just give God praises for this for a while? Can we all stand on our feet? Um, you know, Mav is here. Uh, Mark is here. Some of our leaders are here. You know, Pastor Tom uh, is here. If you need any moment of prayer, you'd like for us to pray for you, um, all you need to do is right after this service, just approach us right here. Uh, we're more than willing to pray for you. Pastor Don is here. You can approach him um, if you want to be prayed for. All right? We just lift our hands before God for a while. Allow me to pray for everyone. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace and shalom. Nothing missing, nothing lacking, nothing broken. That is our prayer for every single one of you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, everyone.